Hi, this is Inky35, and I'm going to go ahead and continue here. Um, we were speaking earlier in the Ancient Near East, the Rising of a New Dawn series, the Origins of Man, and where do we come from, the Ancient Near East Cradle of Civilization. The abrupt change in the course of human events that occurred circa 11,000 BC in the Near East and some 2,000 years later in Europe has led scholars to describe that time as the clear end of the Old Stone Age, the Paleolithic, and the beginning of a new cultural era, the Middle Stone Age, Mesolithic. The name is appropriate only if one considers man's principal raw material, which continued to be stone, his dwelling and his mountainous areas were still built of stone. His communities were protected by stone walls. His first agricultural implement, the sickle, was made of stone. He honored and, or protected his dead by covering and adorning their graves with stones, and he used stone to make images of the supreme beings or gods whose benign intervention he sought. So, one such image found in northern Israel and dated to the 9th millennium BC shows the carved head of a god shielded by a striped helmet and wearing some kind of goggles or glasses. From an overall point of view, however, it would be more appropriate to call the age that began circa 11,000 BC not the Middle Stone Age, but the Age of Domestication. Within the span of a mere 3,600 years overnight in terms of the endless beginning, man became a farmer and wild plants and animals were domesticated. So because they planted the vineyards and all these wheats and barley and rye and millet and spelt, all these things that were growing out there, it should be called the age of domestication. Then a new age clearly followed. Our scholars call it the new age of Neolithic Stone Age. But the term is totally inadequate for the main change that had taken place circa 7500 BC was the appearance of pottery. And for reasons that still elude our scholars, but which will become clear as we unfold our tale of prehistoric events, man's march towards civilization was confined for the first several millennia after 11,000 BC to the highlands of the Near East. The discovery of many uses to which clay could be put was contemporary with man's descent from his mountain abodes toward the lower mud-filled valleys. I wonder why it was muddy anyway. Was it because the flood receded? And <laughs> whatever. But that would make sense. But by the 7th millennium BC, the Near Eastern Arc of Civilization was teeming with clay and pottery cultures, which produced great numbers of utensils, ornaments, and statuettes. And by 5000 BC, the Near East was producing clay and pottery objects of superb quality and fantastic design. But once again, progress slowed, and by 4500 BC, archaeological evidence indicates regression was all around. Pottery became simpler. Stone utensils, a relic of the Stone Age, again became predominant. Inhabited sites reveal fewer remains and some sites that had been centers of pottery and clay industries began to be abandoned and distinct clay manufacturing disappeared. There was a general impoverishment of culture according to James Millard, which wrote Earliest Civilizations of the Near East. Some sites clearly bear the marks of the new poverty-stricken phase. So man and his culture were clearly on the decline. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, the Near East witnessed the blossoming of the greatest civilization imaginable, a civilization in which our own is firmly rooted. A mysterious hand once more picked man up out of his decline and 
raised him to an even higher level of culture, knowledge, and civilization. So for a long time, <clears throat> Western man believed that his civilization was the gift of Rome and Greece. But the Greek philosophers themselves wrote repeatedly that they had drawn on even earlier sources. Then later on, travelers returning to Europe reported the existence in Egypt of imposing pyramids and temple cities half buried in the sands guarded by strange stone beasts called sphinxes. And when Napoleon arrived in Egypt in 1799, he took with him scholars to study and explain these ancient monuments. And one of his officers found near Rosetta a stone slab on which was carved a proclamation from 196 BC written in the Egy ancient Egyptian pictographic writing hieroglyphic as well as to other scripts. The decipherment of the ancient Egyptian script and language and the archaeological efforts that followed revealed to Western man that a high civilization had existed in Egypt well before the advent of the Greek civilization. So, Egyptian records spoke of royal dynasties that began circa 3100 BC, two full millennia before the beginning of the Hellenic civilization. And so reaching its maturity in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, Greece was a latecomer rather than an originator. And so was the origin of our civilization then in Egypt? As logical as that conclusion would have seemed, the facts militated against it. Greek scholars did describe visits to Egypt, but the ancient sources of knowledge of which they spoke were found elsewhere. The pre-Hellenic cultures of the Aegean Sea, the Minoan, and the island of Crete. So the Minoan on the island of Crete and the Mycenaean on the Greek mainland revealed evidence that the Near Eastern, not the Egyptian culture, had been adopted. Syria and Anatolia, not Egypt, were the principal avenues through which an earlier civilization became available to the Greeks. And noting that the Dorian invasions of Greece and the Israelite invasion of Canaan followed the exodus from Egypt took place at about the same time, circa the 13th century BC. And scholars have been fascinated to discover a growing number of similarities between the Semitic and Hellenic civilizations. So there is this professor named Cyrus H. Gordon, Forgotten Scripts, evidence for the Minoan language, opened up a new field of study by showing that an early Minoan script called Linear A represented a Semitic language. And he concluded that the pattern as distinct from the content of the Hebrew and Minoan civilization is the same to a remarkable extent and pointed out that the island's name Crete, spelled in Minoan, Kareta, was the same as the Hebrew word Kerait, walled city, and had a counterpart in a Semitic tale of the king of Kerit. And even the Hellenic alphabet, from which the Latin and our own alphabets derive, came from the Near East. And the ancient Greek historians themselves wrote that a Phoenician named Cadmus, ancient, is what that means, brought them the alphabet, comprising the same number of letters in the same order as in Hebrew, and it was the only Greek alphabet when the Trojan War took place. So, the number of letters was raised to 26 by the poet Simonides of Saos, in the 5th century BC. That Greek and Latin writing, and thus the whole foundation of our Western culture, were adopted from the Near East, can easily be demonstrated by comparing the order, names, signs, and even numerical values of the original Near Eastern alphabet with the much later ancient Greek and the more recent Latin. 
and the scholars were aware, of course, of Greek contacts with the Near East in the first millennium BC, culminating with the defeat of the Persians by Alexander the Macedonian in 331 BC. So Greek records contained much information about these Persians and their lands, which roughly paralleled today's Iran. So judging by the names of their kings, Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, and the names of their deities, which appear to belong to Indo-European linguistic system, scholars reached, reached the conclusion that they were all a part of the Aryan lordly people that appeared from somewhere near the Caspian Sea toward the end of the second millennium BC and spread westward to Asia Minor, eastward to India, and then southward to what the Old Testament called the lands of the Medes and the Parsis. And so, yet, all was not that simple because in spite of the assumed foreign origin of these invaders, the Old Testament treated them as part and parcel of biblical events. Cyrus, for example, was considered to be an anointed of Yahweh, quite an unusual relationship between the Hebrew God and a non-Hebrew. So according to the biblical book of Ezra, Cyrus acknowledged his mission to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and stated that he was acting upon orders given by Yahweh, whom he called God of Heaven. So, Cyrus and the other kings of his dynasty called themselves Achaemenids, after the title adopted by the founder of the dynasty, which was Hakam Anish. It was not an Aryan, but a perfect Semitic title, which meant wise man. By and large, scholars have neglected to investigate the many leads that may point to similarities between the Hebrew god Yahweh and the deity of Achaemenids called Wise Lord, whom they depicted as hovering in the skies within a winged globe as shown on the royal seal of Darius. So it, it's been established by now that the cultural, religious, and historic roots of these old Persians go back to the earlier empires of Babylon and Assyria. And so whose extent and fall is recorded in the Old Testament. And the symbols that make up the script that appeared on the Achaemenid monuments and seals were at first considered to be decorative designs. But then we have Engelbert Camphor, who visited Persopolis, the old Persian capital in 1686, and he describes the signs as cuneates, or wedge-shaped impressions, and the script has since been known as cuneiform. So now we are getting through the languages. Now we're finding out where all this stuff is coming from. Okay, so they call it ancient Semitic language. So, as efforts began to decipher the Achaemenid inscriptions, it became clear that they were written in the same script and inscriptions found on ancient artifacts and tablets in Mesopotamia. And the plains and highlands that lay between the Tigris and Euphrates River, intrigued by the scattered finds, Paul M. L. Botta set out in 1843 to conduct the first major purposeful excavation. He selected a site in northern Mesopotamia near present-day Mosul. Now, they call Mosul Khorsabad. So Bada was soon able to establish that the cuneiform inscriptions named the place Dur Sharu Kin, and they were Semitic inscriptions in a, a sister language of Hebrew, and the name meant walled city of the righteous king. Our text would call this king Sargon II. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video right here and I will pick up on the next video from where we left off. I hope you've enjoyed this. This is fascinating history and I will be uploading a new one soon.